morning. morning. How are you? Is that a good or a not so great? That was a good. All right. Uh, Let me give you a couple of announcements uh, before we begin. Um, Let me tell you, Bible study is on Tuesday night at 630. Uh, They are studying King Solomon. I can tell you that on uh, Wednesday is choir practice. Next Monday, the 28th, if you're lucky enough to go to the Board of Trustees meeting, it's uh, at 6 o'clock. Uh, on May, the th- I'm sorry, on March the 30th uh, is the only Lenten dinner we're going to do this year. Uh, and there's the food issues that we always deal with, and there's a sign-up thing in the back. Uh, Alan Mosier is going to be here that night, and Alan recites sections of the Bible. And uh, it's, it's, I saw him a couple years ago, and it's impressive. So uh, if you could be with us that night, that would be great. Uh, a lot of stuff you see on the screen. Uh, SPR is meeting on the 31st at 630. Uh, and the next drive through dinner is on April the 7th. And Holy Week, uh, Palm Sunday this year is April the 10th. Uh, choir will be seeing the cantata at this service. Uh, I can tell you that on the 13th is the uh, Maundy Thursday service, and we're just going to have a traditional service here in the sanctuary. And Good Friday is a 6 to 6 prayer vigil. There's a sign-up sheet uh, out in the narthex for half-hour slots. Uh, I always feel silly saying this, but people always ask me, um, you know, you don't have to be the only one here. If you want to come with a group, that would be great. Uh, we just like the, all the slots to be filled. We're going to end that evening out at Greenhaven for the Tenebrae service for the community Tenebrae service. Okay? So I believe, I believe that's all the announcements that I have. Does anybody else have anything to add? I got to tell you this. Every morning I wake up and there are certain things that I do. And one of the things I've gotten into the habit of doing is if you go to the Weather Channel app, it tells you how many cases of the coronavirus were reported the previous day. Uh, I think every day this week but one, the number of new cases was, was zero. And so, if, if you know, as of today, it looks good. So uh, if you're thankful for that, say amen. 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 So very good. Let us all enter into an attitude of worship.
Let us all stand and sing our opening hymn, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. Please pray with me. Dear Father, as we come here on this third Sunday of Lent, we are thankful for this time of year. It's a time to stop and evaluate our lives. It's a time to be honest with ourselves and see where we're falling short. It is not a time to examine how others are doing. It's a time to examine ourselves. And so I just ask that we can be honest with ourselves. And as we come to worship every week, uh, may we find ourselves being a little bit more like Jesus every day. Once again, I ask for a, a wonderful washing of the Holy Spirit through each person that is gathered here today. Once again, we're all thankful for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, in one voice, let us tell the world exactly what we believe by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.
seated. <clears throat> okay, I said this uh, last week somewhere, maybe here, maybe in 9.15. Uh, I was always taught in seminary that if you do a good job of pastoral care, uh, after about five years, uh, you'll have a lot of prayer concerns. Okay, after 28 years, I have an audit, so a lot of prayer concerns, and uh, there's a lot of folks that we need to pray for. Uh, on the top of my list is Doug Lewis. Doug will be here as your pastor on July the 1st. Uh, he's got a lot to do between now and then, and so we'll pray for Doug. Uh, I certainly want to pray for those folks that are still concerned about uh, COVID. Uh, I want to thank everybody that was here for the prayer service the other night, and thank you for your generosity uh, through everything, the service the other night and, and general offerings. Uh, we have had over $5,000 raised for Ukraine, and uh, I'm thankful for that. If you didn't see the video, uh, I would encourage you to look at it. Uh, we get posts on Facebook from a young man who's in Quivero, and you can just see the stress on his face every day. He's about 30 miles from where the Russians are right now, and so we'll keep all of Ukraine in our prayers. Um, uh, Carolyn Arnsberger is having a heart ablation on Tuesday. Jim Stefanik is having surgery on Tuesday. Uh, people ask me about Lisa. Uh, Lisa is in California. Uh, her daughter had her knee surgery on Monday, and uh, they took more of the femur than they thought they were going to have to take. And so it's more painful than they anticipated. And so uh, we'll keep Sydney Miller and, and Lisa in our prayers. Uh, Lisa left last, what, Sunday morning, 8 o'clock, with all of her delays to get to the West Coast. She didn't get in until midnight and they had to be in the hospital by six in the morning. So it was one long day. So uh, we'll, we'll keep all them in our prayers. John Meredith, I text John on a regular basis and um, he's, he's moving forward. We'll keep him in our prayers. Madeline, we're glad to see you, okay? Uh, I have a reliable source that Howard's four more to go. So we'll keep Howard in our prayers. Uh, Jackie Bragg has lung cancer. Uh, we've been praying for Linda Miller. Uh, Harriet's son, Tim, uh, we'll be praying for him, and um, John Ramsbottom, we've been praying for John, we'll continue to do so. I'm going to ask that you pray for uh, Sue Einan, and Sue was here, and, and Bill were here for a while. Um, they ended up moving to North Carolina. Bill died recently, and Sue has ALS, and it's just a sad story. We'll keep Sue in our prayers. Uh, Nancy Flanage has four more treatments to go. Uh, Joyce Tully has breast cancer. We'll keep Joyce in our prayers. Okay, that's quite a list. I don't expect you to remember them all. Uh, we do not pray to inform God. God knows all, uh, but we pray to, to be like God, to understand God, and that's why prayer is so important. So um, if you have any unspoken prayer concerns, if you'd like to raise your hand. Okay, our epistle lesson today, um, <clears throat> yeah, our epistle lesson today is from the 10th chapter of Romans, and, and Evan, I'm going to ask you to come on up. We're having confirmation kids read uh, the scriptures during this season. Are you ready? No. <laughs> you know, I love an honest answer, you know, that's, uh, go for it. Romans um, chapter 10, verses 5 through 10. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is, the, is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart and that you believe and you are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are, and are saved. Will you please pray with me?
Dear God, as we come in the prayer this morning, we're thankful for your love for each one of us, and we always marvel. Uh, we marvel at the fact that with all the billions of people in the world and all the billions of people that have ever lived in the world, you know us personally. Uh, you know what our greatest desires are in this world. You know our greatest fears in this world. And we're thankful that in this complex world that we do not have to live alone, uh, but we have you. We recognize that the faith was never meant to be lived out in isolation. We're supposed to be surrounded by fellow believers who encourage us along the way, and that is how the faith was designed from the very beginning. We certainly ask that you just uh, be with our church as we go through this season of Lent, and as we march toward that great day of Easter, may we celebrate the fact that we serve a risen Savior, that what Evan read to us was absolutely correct that we must confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God had raised him from the dead. And we're thankful that because of those two things, the mouth and the heart, that we will be saved. And so we are thankful people and we come into your presence and we lift up people to you not to inform you, uh, but to be more like you. And so we certainly lift up Doug to you at this particular time in this time of transition in his life. I certainly pray for the people of Ukraine and, and we cannot imagine uh, whatever problem we are facing in our lives here, if we were going through the same thing there, it would take our, our depth and our problems to a, a, a new magnitude. And so we pray for these people that have done nothing wrong. Uh, I just ask you to be with Carolyn and I ask that you just um, pray that this procedure go well. We certainly pray for Jim and I pray that this surgery go well. I certainly pray for Sydney as she continues to recover and, and she's a long way from Ohio from her family and I just ask that you just be with her. Uh, certainly be with John. We're thankful for John and his friendship with us in this church. I'm thankful that Madeline's here today. I'm thankful that Howard's making progress. We're thankful that Jackie's getting the medical attention that she needs and we certainly pray for Tim as he begins this process. And certainly we pray for Linda. Uh, we continue to pray for John, and we're, we're thankful that he's making progress in his story. And certainly for Sue Einan, we pray for Sue, and, and, and we recognize that this must be a challenging time in her life. And so I lift her extra high to you as well. Uh, once again, we lift up Nancy to you, and now we begin to pray for Joyce. We ask for a blessing in all those stories, because we know that they are not alone, but you're with them, and you're with us now. So, Father, once again, may we march through this season with our eyes fixed on one thing, and the one thing is Jesus, the one who taught us all to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And all of God's people said, Amen. Okay, Lance Armstrong uh, dominated the world of professional cycling for a long time. Uh, remember, he won seven uh, tour, uh, Tours de France uh, between 1999 and 2005 in a row. Um, he was the face of the sport, and let's be honest, I can't think of one other professional cyclist other than him. Um, I don't think I'm unique in that. Uh, however, for years, the rumors dogged him. Uh, the, 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 the UCI, the Union of Cyclists International, okay, suspected that Armstrong was taking steroids, that he was doping. And for a long time, he denied it until Oprah, of all people, broke him down. Remember, he was on Oprah. He admitted that he had been taking steroids. And I got to tell you, I wasn't shocked. I think we all had suspected it for a long time. Uh, on that day, there was no running from it. Lance Armstrong was a doper, uh, he was a cheater, and he was a liar. And since his confession, he's been stripped of all of his titles, and he's been in courtrooms many times uh, from past sponsors. Many consider him to be uh, the greatest liar in the history of professional sports. I, I wrote that line a couple weeks ago. I've been putting a list together of professional liars in professional sports since then. Okay, um, um, today's message is about lying. However, it is not about, um, you know, it is not about lying for personal gain. It is about lying to yourself. In the scripture lesson for today, the Pharisees were lying to themselves. Uh, their lies were exposed when they stood next to Jesus. Okay, and it's amazing how, how your imperfections become clear when you stand next to Jesus and that's what the season of Lent is all about. Uh, this is the third Sunday in Lent, and our gospel reading for today, after the video, is from the eighth chapter of John, and I've called this message today, Living a Lie. So, video, then scripture. Jesus spoke to the Pharisees again. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life and will never walk in darkness. Now you are testifying on your own behalf. What you say proves nothing. No. Even though I do testify on my own behalf, what I say is true. Because I know where I came from and where I'm going. You do not know where I came from or where I'm going. You make judgments in a purely human way. I pass judgment on no one. But if I were to do so, my judgment would be true because I am not alone in this. The Father who sent me is with me. It is written in your law that when two witnesses agree, what they say is true. I testify on my own behalf, and the Father who sent me also testifies on my behalf. Where is your Father? You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Jesus said all this as he taught in the temple, in the room where the offering boxes were placed. And no one arrested him, because his hour had not come. I will go away, you will look for me. But you will die in your sins. You cannot go where I am going. He says that we cannot go where he is going. Does this mean that he will kill himself? You belong to this world here below, but I come from above. You are from this world, but I am not from this world. That is why I told you that you will die in your sins. And you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am who I am. Who are you? What I have told you from the very beginning. I have much to say about you, much to condemn you for. The one who sent me, however, is truthful. And I tell the world only what I have heard from him. They did not understand that Jesus was talking to them about the Father. When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. Then you will know that I do nothing on my own authority. 
but I say only what the Father has instructed me to say. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Because I always do what pleases him. Many who heard Jesus say these things believed in him. Let us all stand for the gospel reading. John chapter 8, verses 12 through 20. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I came, where I come from, and wh or where I am going. You will judge by human you judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one, but I if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father. He sent me. They, then they asked him, where is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the pal place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because our, his hour had not yet come. The word of God for the people of God. If you're thankful for Evan, say amen. amen. Please be seated. Okay, will you please pray with me? <clears throat> Dear Father, as we come here this morning, we will admit it that we're all sinners. Uh, that is what this season is about, to remind us that we are sinners and we have this work to do. And so, Father, we, we will confess it. Uh, we'll also confess it that we live in exhausting times. Uh, we're tired of all the negativity. Uh, the more that we learn about our world, the more, more pessimistic we become. It is difficult to watch the news because we're so tired of the negativity and we need a sense of hope and, and, and optimism. Uh, we'll also confess that our own death bothers us, that time goes fast. Seems like just a couple weeks ago we could run like the wind, but, but none anymore. And we recognize that our death does bother us and, and we'd actually like to live for eternity. And so once again, I just ask that you just pour the gift of preaching through me that through my simple words, we may experience your word, so we can apply those words to our daily lives. Once again, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> we find ourselves in the eighth chapter of John, and according to the text, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's actually at the temple, and according to the reading and according to the video, Jesus was where they took the, the offering. Uh, in those courts, rabbis also came, and with them came their students or their disciples, and they would all teach their divine truth. Jesus was no exception. Uh, Jesus went there to teach his divine truth, and when Jesus taught, a large crowd came because they wanted to hear what the master had to offer. On that particular day, Jesus looks out, at the crowd that is gathered, and have you ever woken up and went, this is going to be a bad day, okay? Jesus knew it was going to be a bad day, because when he went out and he surveyed the crowd, there were his well-organized enemies, the Pharisees. And you remember them, usually it suffices to say that they were experts on the law. That was no small task. There were 613 different laws, it's kind of interesting that of the 613 laws, 365 were negative laws. And you know 365, that's one year, 65 days in a year. Uh, what you may not know is that there were 248 positive laws. And that's the number of bones and organs in a human body. 
And if you add together the 365 and the 248, you get to 613. Um, the, the, the truth is, the, the truth is that the, the Pharisees really believed in those laws. Uh, they believed that those laws were the keys to enlightenment. And they believed that if they kept the laws, all 365, all, all 613 of them, on one day, if everybody would do that, it would hasten the coming of the Messiah. Uh, they were not insincere. They really believed that. And they believed that that was going to be the case. And so they took the law extremely seriously. The law was the key to everything. That's why verse 12 has to have enraged the Pharisees. Because verse 12 says that it is not, has nothing to do with the law, but it had everything to do with Jesus. Verse 12, Jesus says that I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will walk, whoever, whoever follows me will walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Uh, what does that mean? It means that Jesus is the, the key to spiritual enlightenment. And because of this debate between the law and Jesus, the true light, this great debate breaks out. In the end, Jesus wins the debate because he knew where he came from, he knew where he was going, and the Pharisees knew neither. Let me say it again. The Pharisees believed, they just believed in the wrong thing. So to speak, they were lying to themselves. There are an awful lot of people in our society, in our world, that are always lying to themselves. They really believe what they believe. The problem is that they're wrong. In the world today, there are 1.8 billion Muslims, okay? 1.8 billion Muslims, you know, they're really lying to themselves. I don't know how else to say it. Um, there are many sincere Muslims that just believe the wrong thing. Uh, they believe that, that the body and the soul are separated at death. Uh, Muslims believe that, 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 that they stay in the grave until the, the day of judgment, when Allah judges the evil from the, the righteous. Uh, they believe they believe that when somebody dies, uh, the person is dead, but their spirit returns seven days after their death, and they go home and visit their family. And they believe that 14 days after the person dies, the person returns again in spirit form to visit their home. And on the first anniversary of their death, they return home one more time to say goodbye one more time. In Islam, Muslims, uh, Allah decides uh, who will die and, and when they will die. Now, there are parts of the elements of the, of, of the Islamic faith that are sounding an awful lot like Christianity, and that's probably why we don't get along. It's like a family feud. But the truth is this, the only thing that Islam really misses is a savior. In Islam, Allah stayed in heaven and judges the right from the, from the wrong. In our understanding of the faith, God came back into this world, took human form, the incarnation of God, and died on the cross for our sins. We have a savior. Islam does not. A life without Jesus is really living a lie. If you're thankful for Jesus, say amen. In the world today, there are one billion, with a B, okay, Hindus, okay, and I hate to say it, uh, there are some sincere Hindus, but they're really lying to themselves. Uh, they believe that the spirit is constantly shifting from one person to the next, one body to the next. Uh, that process of life cycle process is called the uh, Samara, and the spirit in each one of us, they say, is called the Atman. And the death, the atman, the spirit, simply transfers to another body. And you can tell what kind of life you lived in your previous life by the life that you have today. If you have a good life today, they would say it's because you lived a good life before. And so you have a good life today. We must have had 
good lives before because we all have good lives today. But if you have a miserable life, Hindus say it's because you were a miserable person before and you did nothing positive and you deserve the miserable life that you have because you're being punished for the life that you lived. Can I tell you the truth? One life for me is enough. When I get out of here, okay, I don't want to come back as somebody else. One life is enough for me. If one life is enough for you, say amen. In our world today, there are a lot of people that are living a lie. They believe, they believe that there is nothing about the afterlife at all. I hate to say it, you know, there are some nice people in there, I'm sure, but they're, they're living a lie. According to the Pew Research Group, 7% of all Americans are either atheists or agnostics. They think that when you die, you die, okay? That when you die, it's like turning the light out. It's simply over. And they don't believe there is an afterlife in any way. You're just complete. And they can make a big list of famous people, you know, that, that say that there really is nothing else, that they're, they're atheists. Morgan Freeman is on the list. And if I was as old as Morgan Freeman, I think I might start believing in something, right? Brad Pitt Exciting Brad Pitt believes in nothing. Woody Allen believes in nothing. Daniel Radcliffe, the Harry Potter guy, you know, he believes in nothing. Stephen Hawking was smarter than all of us combined. He believed in nothing. Sigmund Freud believed in nothing. Turn the light switch on. Think about Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison believed in nothing after death, along with Karl Marx. I could go on, but I'm not going to go on because I don't have time, but you get the point. 7% of our population is living a lie. And they try to ignore death by saying that there is no afterlife. They don't believe in there their being a happy ending. I like happy endings. If you like a happy ending in heaven, say amen. Okay, let me say this. Um, uh, uh, George Lee. Don and Brenda, you know George Lee. You folks know George Lee, okay? Uh, George Lee is, is, is a retired pastor in the area, even though he keeps working, okay? And, and George Lee has been a good friend to me. And, and you know, when I was gone, George Lee was a good friend uh, to this church. Uh, he told the illustration years ago, and I just cannot forget about it. It was a great illustration, and it must be a great illustration because I've told it so many times, I can tell it better than George Lee, okay? George says that he once served a church, okay? And in the church, it was filled with a lot of nice people, and, and there was one lady in the church, and she was a real church person, okay? And whatever the church did, the woman supported it, okay? Uh, whatever it was. You know, she served on every committee twice, right? She taught Sunday school. She sang in the choir. She did it all. If there was a trustee work day, you know, she would show up to do it. If, 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 if there was anything that happened, she was there every single worship service. She was always there. And she always worked in the kitchen. Now, I try to stay out of the kitchen here, okay? Okay not this lady, and I, I don't understand the kitchen, to be honest with you, but, but, but from what I get out of it, you know, when you go into the kitchen, everybody has a job. Am I right? Okay? This woman in this story had the same job all the time. You remember what she, her job was? She peeled the potatoes. And she would peel the potatoes for every dinner. I guess it would be drive through, she'd peel the potatoes or eat inside, meals to shut in, she'd peel the potatoes. She peeled a lot of potatoes through the years. And she kept peeling the potatoes. She peeled more potatoes than anybody in the history of that church. And people would just identify her as the potato peeler. One day George says he got a call, okay? He got a call that, that, that the potato peeling lady had terminal cancer. And George is a great pastor. George goes and 
visits the woman. She's got a great attitude. She's going to beat it. And George would visit her from time to time, but he saw in time to time that, that, that the, the cancer was winning and she was beat down. He said one night he was getting ready for bed. He got the call that the woman was rushed to the hospital, was near the end. George, being George, got dressed, drove to the hospital, went to a room, and sat there with her, and they talked. He knew there wasn't much time left, and she looked at George, and she said, George, can I ask you a question? And George said, sure. She said, George, have I peeled enough potatoes to get into heaven? George said he almost cried. The woman knew everything about the church, could name all the previous pastors backwards and forwards, served on all the committees, but she didn't hear it. We're not saved by what we do in church. We're saved by grace and by grace alone. There simply are not enough potatoes to save yourself. There just are not enough anthems to sing to save yourself. There's not enough Sunday school classes to teach to save yourself. There's not enough sermons to preach to save yourself. We're all saved by grace, and we're all saved by grace alone. And if you think you can earn your way into heaven by doing whatever, you're lying to yourself because it simply is not going to happen. It's called works righteousness, and it's a, pro it's a product of the Protestant work ethic. And the Protestant work ethic is a great thing. It basically says anything worth having is worth working for. And it was wonderful in America because we built a wonderful country because of the Protestant work ethic, but it has eroded away our faith because you cannot save yourself. It promotes works at the expense of grace. And it's one of my constant themes, you know, that I always preach on. I'm not making any progress with it because every single time I have a funeral, it's always the same thing. I'll be standing there at the casket and there's a deceased laying there in the casket. And I'll stand there with the family and, and they'll start reminiscing about how life was for him or her. It's always the same. They were a great person, you know, they would do anything for anybody. They give you the shirt off their back and then somebody will say it. They have to say it. If anybody deserves to go to heaven, they do. I've never corrected anybody yet, but I think I got 85 days left still, so I might. I'm gonna say, no, they didn't deserve to go to heaven. They deserve to go to hell. And so do you, because we simply can't save ourselves. We're saved by grace, and we're saved by grace alone. I hope you're not lying to yourself. You know it. You know the old gospel story and how it worked. Jesus was born in the ordinary way, yet he lived that extraordinary life. There was something curious about him, though, from the beginning, because his biological father was God. Jesus never traveled more than 30 miles, right? And yet everywhere he went, he talked about the kingdom of God. Everywhere he went, he healed the sick and the afflicted. Everywhere he went, he simply loved everybody, and guess what he did? He treated everybody with dignity and respect. And that should have been good enough, right? It should have been. But Jesus made powerful enemies in, in high places. And they couldn't tolerate this love and everybody thing, so they decided to get rid of him. And one of Jesus' own, you might have heard of him, Judas Iscariot, betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He regretted that choice. And remember, he hung himself because he couldn't live with the fact that he, he, he was responsible. On that Passover meal, Jesus goes to the upper room with the disciples. They have that last supper. They go to the courtyard to pray. And it's in the courtyard during prayer that Jesus is arrested. In the next few hours, Jesus endures two trials. 
One was in front of his own people, right? The Sanhedrin. And they had all that they needed to prove that Jesus was guilty. They had it all. It was a monkey trial. Jesus really didn't have a chance. They had all that they needed, but they did not have the authority to execute Jesus. And so they took Jesus to the one that had the authority to execute him, the Roman governor Pilate. And Pilate, while he's a spineless, weedly kind of a guy, he saw through the nonsense and he tried to get away out of it. And remember, they give Jesus the choice, the people the choice. You could have Jesus, the sinless one. He loved everybody, healed everybody, taught about the kingdom of God, or you can have Barabbas. Remember how it works out? The people want Barabbas, and Barabbas' neighbors are upset because they didn't want him to come back. But they took Jesus. And the Roman soldiers did what they were supposed to do. They made the last miserable days of hours of Jesus' life truly miserable. And the Romans execute Jesus in Roman style. He, he's executed on a cross between two criminals. And when he dies, people cry. And the contrast between the tears of Good Friday and, and the cheers of Palm Sunday are, are shocking. In our time, we're always worried about the proud. Jesus wasn't worrying about the crowd. He was looking for the committed. And they put him in the tomb. And they went away numb and tearful. Now, do you remember what happened on Saturday? Nothing. The brother was dead. He was just dead. No life signs, no breathing, no heartbeat, nothing. He was dead. And when the women show up early on Sunday morning, they can't touch the body on the Sabbath, they make the great discovery that somehow Jesus had come back to life. I don't know how that happened. I've never been able to explain a miracle, but I do know that it changed absolutely everything. The women are walking there slowly, got this horrible job, and they're worrying about how they're going to roll the stone back. But, but like I used to tell my kids, 90% of the things we worry about never happen. They didn't have to worry about it because when they got there, the stone was rolled away. And when they looked in, its body was gone. And they began to worry. Don't you hate when you lose a corpse? They thought that the punishment of Friday wasn't enough. That they had taken the body somewhere. And then they're told by somebody else that Jesus is resurrected. They run and tell the disciples, and the disciples come back, and sure enough, they find out that Jesus has been resurrected. And in a short time, they see Jesus. And for the next 40 days, Jesus walked around in that resurrected state and proved to everybody that he was alive and well. He eats the fish to show them that his is a bodily resurrection. And then he ascends into heaven. And 10 days later, the Holy Spirit comes down and ignites this new organization called a church. It's important that you know that I'm not lying to you. It's important that you know the truth. Your only hope of salvation is your belief in the resurrected Jesus. You heard it read to you so well. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, remember, you will be saved. It's my favorite Bible verse. And Jesus did not lie to the Pharisees. All those years ago, he was the light of the world. Plato. Plato once said that we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us all pray. Dear Father, as we come here today, we are thankful for your love for us. We're thankful that the Bible holds the truth. And we have a surplus of people in our society that can 
write legal contracts because we have so many liars, but the Bible says it clearly, and the Bible is accurate, and the Bible is true. That if, that if we can unite our, our, our mouth and our hearts, uh, you know, confessing and believing in the resurrection, that we will be saved. And so as resurrection people, we stand in your presence, thankful for all that you've done for us. Once again, it is your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Let us all stand and sing our closing hymn, O Wondrous Sight, O Vision Fair. for the benediction. And now may God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you all now and forevermore. Amen. Everybody have a great week. Mm -hmm.